Well, thanks again for joining us. I am Paola Yuspa Abbott. I'm president of Top of Mind uh, PR. We are a boutique PR agency with offices in South Florida, Washington, DC, and the Southwest. Uh, we work with businesses in different industries, including real estate, legal, finance, and advocacy. And the information we will share today come from our experience interacting with reporters and our clients, which range from Fortune 500 to small but influential companies. Uh, my colleagues, Courtney Moverly Moreno and Jessica Forrest will be presenting with me. And I hope we can give you great ideas in the next 30 minutes to make your job easier moving forward. By the way, feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to send us questions through the, um, you know, through the presentation. We will answer them at the end of the program. Um, Courtney, the floor is yours to discuss how to augment communications with AI tech. Thanks, Paula. So I'm Courtney Moberly Moreno. I'm an account manager and digital marketing leader with Top of Mind. And like Paula mentioned, the first topic that we'll be covering today is one that is on all of our minds how to augment communications with AI platforms like ChatGPT. We'll explore how professional service companies like commercial real estate firms and law practices can harness the power of AI to boost their online presence and communication efforts. AI technology has evolved significantly, and today we have a wide range of applications designed to cater to various needs. AI can analyze and classify images, making it easier to sort and manage visual content. AI-powered tools can transcribe and analyze video content, providing insights and helping with video SEO. And AI, like ChatGPT, can also assist in drafting emails, press releases, social media posts, improving efficiency, and reducing human effort. So we're gonna start by giving a brief overview of a few AI softwares that you can use to enhance your communication strategy. Up first is Pictori. So this is an AI video generator that enables you to easily create and edit high quality videos. You can do that using plain text, you can create video highlights, or you can auto summarize long videos. Another great tool is Murph. It's a text speech generator that enables you to convert text to speech, create vo voiceovers or do dictations. And then one that we're probably all familiar with is Notion. That's a productivity and note-taking web application. They recently launched an AI integration that allows you to summarize existing content, brainstorm ideas, write a rough draft, or even fix spelling and grammar. And of course, the one that we're most familiar with, ChatGPT. So businesses can use ChatGPT to enhance customer support, generate content, draft communications, analyze data, schedule meetings, and provide language translation. It can be used to help improve efficiency, customer engagement, and decision-making while saving time and resources. And these are just a few of the AI tools that are out there. As the technology advances, we're seeing new tools launch literally every single day. It's important to note though, that while AI offers numerous benefits, that it cannot fully replicate that human touch Every piece of content that's generated by AI needs to be reviewed and verified by a human to ensure accuracy, tone, and context. AI serves as a tool to support and enhance human strategy rather than replace it. It can be a very powerful tool for businesses, but you have to ensure that the AI-generated content aligns with your company's brand voice, values, and guidelines. Another key item to take note of is that AI, particularly ChatGPT, pulls information from publicly available websites. So it's more important than ever that your online presence is up to date and accurate. You need to be regularly reviewing your website, social media profiles, and online directories to ensure that AI has access to the most accurate information about your business. So to sum it up, AI can play a significant role in enhancing your communication strategies for public relations and digital marketing. By understanding the capabilities, but also the limitations of AI, companies can harness this technology to boost their online presence and communication strategies. Next is my colleague Jess for DEI and media relations. Thanks, Courtney. So my name is Jessica Forrest and I'm the executive vice president here at Top of Mind. And I'm gonna be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
So as you know, DEI policies have become essential in today's business landscape. You know, if you don't have a DEI policy in place by now, you really need to have one. Um, and and your your public relations strategy should have you know DEI policies within it. Um, because reporters, as we're seeing, are looking for more diverse voices in their stories. I can't tell you how many times I've sent a pitch to a reporter and they will respond asking me for a, a spokesperson who is either a woman or a person of color. And most of the time, unfortunately, I have to pass on the opportunity because our client may not have a woman or a person of color who is media trained on that particular topic. So, you know, in fact, I was actually speaking with a journalist the other day who works in mainstream media, and he said that, you know, his news outlet uh, DEI policy requires reporters now to include diverse sources, um, you know, in his stories. So this trend is not going away anytime soon. Um, I would highly recommend investing in media training so you can have a more diverse array of spokespeople. You know, as well as, you know, in, in, you know, for media relations, of course, but also as well as having those spokespeople write blog posts to get their thoughts on paper and um, up to speed on particular topics. It's not only important for your company's public image, but it also ensures that your company is well positioned to provide commentary on various topics and from different perspectives. And it also shows your employees that you're committed to promoting a diverse and inclusive workplace. I would also recommend measuring the impact of these efforts as well. Obviously, you can track the number of times your spokespeople are quoted um, and in which outlets, but it will be important to measure whether or not those opportunities arise for that spokesperson um, as a result of media coverage. And because of the, just the nature of our business, a lot of the times, you know, this type of measurement is anecdotal. So you'll need to be proactive in your communication with spokespeople to see what responses they receive from being quoted in stories. I'm now gonna turn it over to Paola who will discuss blending internal and external communications for brand awareness. Great, thank you, Jess. So 2023 is the year when internal and external communications must align. Um, in our daily practice, we see companies handling internal communications differently from external, and that hurts branding efforts in a time of information overload. So, you know, as you all know, internal communication involves developing messaging for the employees about what the company is all about, the competitive advantage that the company brings to, to the clients, its values, culture, how it benefits the community, and most importantly, where the company wants to go in terms of growth. And the external communication should mirror that messaging, but of course, tailored to, you know, the media, current clients and prospective clients, you know, with business development in mind. But, you know, why, why are we talking about this? And the reason is companies and employees are increasingly using digital media to communicate about their services, successes, challenges, frustrations at work, and so forth. So all those pieces of narrative planted here and there, and that building a company's digital DNA at the end of the day. So any information put out there by your team members needs to follow the same narrative that the company has developed to communicate with clients and reporters to avoid presenting different fronts, you know, different positioning. Like I always say to our clients, now more than ever, and thanks to open AI, anything that is published online about your company will determine how Jab TPT will write about, about you. Um, so now we have to be very mindful like Corny was saying before about what we put out there. That's why it's so important that, you know, what, what the, the trained spokesperson says to the media is aligned with what, you know, your, your employees are, are saying in their own social media. Now, that same principle applies to traditional media. When external and internal communications are not aligned, chances are the company spokesperson will communicate different positions on the same issue. When the article are published, when that article when those articles are published, the confusion, the confusing messaging will live forever online. And that information will be picked up and reused by reporters, as you know, by publications, or like we said before, by Chab GPT. So the end result is a weakened brand, diluted by competing narratives. In conclusion, you know, by aligning external and internal communications, you owned the narrative. You leave no room for confusion 
or avoid to be failed by reporters' perception of your company, your competitors' opinions of you, and other third parties. You own your story. So, you know, what, what can we do? Well, you know, the internal communication team should see the PR team, the outside agency working on the external communication as partners in content development and vice versa. Both teams should be attending meetings together and collaborating on one universal messaging to be used internally and externally. Also make sure press coverage secured by your PR team are positioned, are, are being distributed internally to all the employees so that they can see how the company is being positioned. They can feel proud of, of their company. And, and at the same time, you know, any internal communication, uh, be, you know, like blogs or CSUIT profiles, anything that the internal team developed, share with your PR team. So the PR team can repurpose that material and turn it into pitches or media opportunities. So we are communicating the same message uh, you know, even though we're targeting different audiences. So I hope that helps. And let me go ahead and invite Jess back to the floor to discuss how the newsroom has changed after the pandemic. Thanks, Jess. Paula. So I know everyone is probably sick and tired of talking about the pandemic, but it has changed the way we work and live, and especially in the news industry. So in regards to the newsroom, the pandemic accelerated many changes that were already underway, such as the shift toward digital and remote work. And for this webinar, we actually talked to a couple of journalists to get their thoughts as well as combine them with what we're seeing as PR professionals. And I think the biggest change is remote work, and it's definitely impacting the way we build relationships with journalists. In the past, we would schedule in-person meetings with our clients and a journalist, but according to the journalists we spoke to, they would prefer to have, you know, Zoom coffee chats, you know, which ultimately gives the same benefits as meeting in person, except, you know, you can do it from the comfort of, of their own home. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about getting to a meeting place, picking out an outfit to wear. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of benefits to that. <laughs> Less stress too. Um, and as a PR professional, I really like these Zoom coffee chats because it allows your client to connect with reporters on an even more personal level. So they provide a glimpse into the personal lives of both parties, you know, those unexpected moments is like your dog barking or a colleague popping up in the background, I feel can really help humanize the conversation and build a stronger rapport. And I think that the informal setting lends itself better to building a relationship between your client and the reporter in the long run. Another big change is events, you know, while they may be back attendance in some cases is spotty and isn't where it was before the pandemic. From what I've experienced, it's been mixed. Um, I've attended some events that are jam packed and others that aren't. So if you're going to host an event, really think about the value it will bring to your attendees. Don't just have you know, an event to stroke your ego. Like it needs to be valuable for the, for the people attending and especially journalists. Um, but with that said, I mean, I still think that webinars are here to stay and are a great tool for reaching your audience outside of a particular geographic area. Um, for us, we continue to hold press webinars, which are like virtual press conferences, and attendance has still been really strong. Um, now, another change we've seen is the live streaming of events uh, for reporters you know, who can't attend in person but I'm not sure it's really worth the cost. Um, in our experience, virtual attendance has been low whenever we live streamed an event, but the only benefit of that is of the live streaming is the recording of the event because you can repurpose that video. Like for example, you know, we'll send it to, we'll send the recording to reporters, we'll upload it to YouTube. We can repurpose it for social media, design, you know, and design and create an e-blast to share it with our clients distribution list. Also, like you can pull out a clip and create a short form video to share on Facebook and Instagram stories or on TikTok. Um, and then you can also take the audio and create a podcast. So the recording is, is great from, you know, if you can get a recording of the event um, and, uh, you know, as you're planning events, you know, I would price out like, oh, should I just record the event or, you know, also live stream it. And if it's the same price of, of you know, live streaming, then just live stream the event because you'll get the, the recording afterwards. But definitely try to record it at your event or like try to record some panels um, because you can do, you know, you can create content from that. 
So the next trend um, isn't necessarily new. I mean, we all know newsroom budgets cuts were already underway before the pandemic. And, you know, newsrooms, they just don't have the resources like they once did. So now more than ever, we are noticing reporters relying on us for photos and video for their stories. Um, so we're often, you know, at an event taking photos, you know, taking B-roll for the reporters for them to insert into like their television stories. You know, I was recently at an event that reporters attended and afterward, you know, they asked me to send them photos and videos that I took. Now I was taking photos and videos like for my client social media channels, for my own personal ones and for the top of mind social media channels. But I really wasn't thinking, um, you know, because the reporters were there, I thought they would do their, you know, take their own photos and video. But instead, you know, I sent them all that material afterwards and they used it. And this was from multiple outlets. Um, for their stories. And I think that's because like reporters now, like they have to write like four stories a day, you know, so when they're at an event, they're worried about really getting the interviews for, you know, for their stories and not really thinking of the visual component. And one of the reporters we talked to says, I love it when, you know, somebody sends me tons of photos with like a pitch they sent. Um, because, because, you know, it, I guess, you know, when people click on photos more than they do on the stories. So, so anyways, it's something to be aware of. Um, so, you know, if you're hosting an event and you have a budget, you know, definitely hire a professional photographer or videographer, you know, if you can, but if you don't have a budget, that's okay too. Um, you can, you know, the iPhone has, you know, high quality photos and video. So it really doesn't, I mean, e either way is fine, but um, I would also suggest though, if you're gonna do it yourself and on your iPhone, like buy like on Amazon, like an LED video light that attaches to your phone. I mean, they look a little ridiculous, but they really do enhance your photos and videos um, and they look very, and makes it look really professional. So now I will pass it over to Courtney to discuss using social media as a search engine. Thanks, Jess. So our last trend is speaking about how people are increasingly using social media platforms to search for information and how companies can benefit from this shift. So in recent years, we've seen a significant increase in the number of users turning to social media platforms as a primary source of information. That trend is driven by the desire for quick, digestible, and engaging content. They want what they need fast, and social media platforms are adapting to meet those demands. TikTok in particular has emerged as a popular platform for discovering new information, um, mostly due to its short form videos and powerful algorithm. It's become the go-to platform for users seeking content on a wide range of topics. So that presents a unique opportunity for B2B companies to tap into that growing trend. So some tips and strategies for companies to leverage TikTok as a search engine are creating valuable content. Try to focus on sharing information that's informative, useful, and relevant to your target audience. Um, if you're a commercial real estate company, you can showcase property tours, market updates, and industry insights. Law firms could share short videos on legal updates, case studies, and expert opinions. Um, always make sure that you're using hashtags. They're crucial for discoverability on TikTok. Research and use industry-specific and trending hashtags to increase your content's visibility. But that's also true for all social media channels. It should be on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of them, you should be using hashtags that are relevant to your business. And then if it makes sense for your industry, partner with industry influencers to increase your reach and credibility. Um, influencers can help create and share content that highlights your services and expertise and then disseminates it directly to your target audience. And the most important tip is to make sure that you are engaging with your audience. Respond to comments and messages and encourage them to ask questions. It fosters a sense of community and positions your company as a thought leader. The trend of using social media platforms as search engines is here to stay. TikTok, with its unique format and growing user base, is an excellent opportunity for companies to establish their presence and engage with potential clients. The content can also be repurposed for Facebook Watch or Instagram Reels. And by leveraging the platform strategically, B2B companies can tap into a new pool of prospects and stay ahead of the competition. That's it for me. Thank you, Courtney. Appreciate it. 
Um, so we are opening the uh, floor for questions. Uh, we have the uh, Q&A uh, chat open. If anybody wants to write here, here we have a question. Okay, what are, uh, Courtney, I believe this is for you. What are some potential risks or drawbacks to using AI generated content in public relations and digital marketing? Yeah, so I would say probably one of the biggest drawbacks is that um, its knowledge base can be limited and it's just pulling data as quickly as possible from a variety of resources online. It can seem really convenient, but what that lends to is that it's compiling all this information that may not be accurate and may not all relate to each other. So I know just like from my personal experience, I've asked it to write me a bio and, you know, it'll pull all kinds of crazy information. I wish I had an MBA, but <laughs> ChatGPT just gave me one. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be aware of monitoring the content and making sure that you're giving it an edit and a read through so that you can ensure that it's accurate. You know, that is so true. I, I recommend anyone who haven't done it yet to do that exercise, go to ChatGPT and ask it to write your bio. And then you're going to understand, you know, how great it can be, but how inaccurate it can be and why it is so important to be on top of whatever content, you know, you create on, on, on you know, using AI. Um, yeah, that's a great exercise we should all do. Okay, we have another question. Oh, oh that's for me. Uh, you know, when you talk about aligning external and internal communications, is there a specific way to do that? Um, you know, there, there are some ways, you know, cre creating a corporate uh, messaging documents, you know, that can be shared when, you know, not only when uh, you hire a new employee, but from time to time, uh, you know, sharing this, this messaging document with, with your team members is, is very important. And then just, you know, we have so many tools, right, to communicate with the external world. We, we have newsletter so you could do you know every month or every two months do an internal newsletter uh, with the same type of positive news that we share with our prospective clients uh, uh, about you know articles that were published and you know positive news uh, same thing you know direct emails reinforcing you know messaging so just think about the same uh, tactics that you know we use you know the PR the external communication team will use but, you know, redirect it uh, for your um, internal, uh, you know, communications needs. Let's see, I believe we have another one. Uh, Courtney, for you, what, what advice do you have for businesses that are new to TikTok and looking to create content that appeals to their target audience? So that's a really good question. I think that the key is to actually spend some time on the app and look at other relevant profiles that are in the same industry as you. Um, by kind of taking a look and, and seeing how their content performs and how their audience is engaging, it can help you build a strategy of your own. Try to think about who your target audience is, what they would be interested in, and then go from there. So kind of building the content to match what they may be searching for while keeping it relevant to your lines of service. Awesome. Uh, another question, has this shift toward remote, I'm sorry, I'm getting old, but my glasses don't seem to work well anymore. Has this shift towards remote work and digital communication changed the way PR professionals pitch stories to journalists? And if so, how? Okay, I, I can take this one. Um, I mean, you know, we're still writing the same pitches, but I think what's interesting, um, especially in terms of local news, which can be very parochial, um, we're seeing them more open to sources outside of their jurisdiction. So, for example, we had one client who's based in DC, uh, in DC and very national, um, and um, and the Tampa a Tampa news station you know, wanted them to speak about a certain topic for, for their newscast. And then also like we've seen like the Tampa, um, the Tampa uh, 
you know, broadcast journalists, you know, they don't mind now like interviewing someone from Miami if they're talking about all of Florida. So it's not as parochial as it once was. So don't be afraid to like pitch sources. I mean, obviously they, I mean, don't pitch somebody like on Miami for the Tampa market, but if they are, you know, general enough, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, the, the local news stations be more receptive to, to interviewing people outside of like their area. Yeah, and I would add that, um, especially in the legal uh, industry, you know, in the past, you know, the Miami Herald would reach out and say, hey, do you have an expert group that can comment on, you know, maybe a national law like EB-5 or something? And in the past, they wanted the, the lawyer to be based down here. Now, publications are more open to, like Jess was saying, uh, of interviewing someone who can comment on EB-5, even if the person is in another market like Philadelphia or New York, they're fine with it. And I was happily surprised to see how reporters, you know, are opening up their, their mind to, uh, you know, a source is a source. Someone with knowledge is someone with knowledge. Um, okay, we have one more question, and I believe um, we may have to uh, wrap up. When you talk about a company, digital DNA uh, is created by all the content out there, but a company, how can an employer force the employee to write posts on their personal social media channels? to be aligned with the corporate messaging. Well, you know, <laughs> unless the, the content this employee is, is writing is extremely offensive and it's gonna hurt, you know, the, the company, the reputation of our company, we can't really force them to say, hey, you know, we have to use these keywords, but what you can do is educate them on the company messaging. We have noticed that often employees, you know, mischaracter, you know, they, they write, things that are not aligned to the company messaging, but it's not because they want to do it on purpose. It's just they don't know better. And when we come back to them and we say, hey, you know, so you posted whatever. And, you know, it would be a great way to say the same thing, but using this, they're so open because, you know, they don't really have to think. They just go like, oh, okay, great. Thank you. They're very appreciative when we help them understand uh, how to position the company. But if they don't receive that kind of training, um, if internally they don't know how to position what is good about their company, uh, then they just don't know. You know, we know what we know. Um, so let's make it easier for them and give them the script. Yeah, and, and I'd like to add for, for some of our clients, we actually like will manage their LinkedIn channels, um, especially the Rainmakers are the ones that, um, that, that have a good network on their LinkedIn. So, you know, we'll, we'll write the post for them and then, you know, everyone approves it and then it gets posted online. Of course you can't, I mean, if you have like 500 employees, that's impossible to do really, but you can like pick and choose like a handful of employees who you think would bring more business to you and then, you know, invest that time into them. And I think a great thing to do to add on to, to what both Jess and Paula said is, you know, ensure that you have some kind of social media guidelines for your company and that um, your employees are informed about what those are and what social media best practices are. Um, encouraging them to share posts that generate from the company's LinkedIn or the company's social media not only expands the reach of, of your company's pages, but it also ensures that the messaging is controlled. So you can either provide pre-written posts, um, you know, about a topic, circulate it to everyone and say, hey, if you're planning on posting about this, here's the language. Or share the link to your post once it's live and say, hey, our post is live if you wanted to share it on your own page. Um, so I think that at the end of the day, it's just about making sure that your employees are informed.